Good afternoon and welcome to Iowa City Public Library. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Wow, this is a wonderful, huge group and I'm so delighted that you're here and sorry that it's just taking us a couple extra minutes to get all the details set before we go. Um, my name is Kara Logsett. I'm the Adult Services Coordinator here at the library. And we love, absolutely love working with Project Green on these forums. Um, we always have wonderful speakers. Uh, we're able to talk about our wonderful collection of gardening books that we have up on the second floor. We also have all of the, the forums that have been going on at the library for years and years, they're always videotaped and then we add those videos to the collection. So you can always come to the library and check those out. Or if you live in Iowa City, the forums always replay on the library channel, which is cable channel 10. And I should note, um, we are live on the library channel today too. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Check out the books and the videos and other materials that are up on the second floor. And now I'll turn it over to Bernie Knight from Project Green. Thank you. And aren't we lucky today to have Trudy here with us. I have to make a few announcements and then we'll get her up here. Um, we want to check and thank Beth who's the technician that does our TVs and they did give you information about that. Um, and also they have the TVs on past forums if you want to check them out. It takes about two weeks to get one made. Um, Project Green, our current endeavors, the trees and shrubs on North Dubuque Street. Have some of you been watching those? We hope so. Um, Project Green's paid 100000 plus to develop that new entry area. Um, we also, and then we have tornado projects, Iowa Avenue and College Green Park that we're working with the city to redo. Various schools, we have a Project Green grants for schools like West High, Southeast Junior High, Coralville, Kirkwood, and Central, which is very worthwhile working with the schools. Our annual plant sale this year, May the 5th. And thanks to all of you who do attend and purchase our plants. Also, a number of you come to our garden tours. There will be two more forums, March the 1st, which is the first Sunday, with Christine Engelbright. And she's talking on what's wrong with this plant? Can I fix it? <laughs> I'm sure all of us have questions like that. April the 1st is Kathy Barish, and she's talking on container gardens in all sizes. And that is also on the first Sunday. Trudy, of course, is, has many publications and is founder of Market Day. She's raised millions of dollars for education. Her garden is visited by hundreds annually, and what a gracious hostess she is. Her garden creates a vista, a vista to behold. You drive up and somehow all these annuals burst into bloom for Trudy. <laughs> Wonderful colors. You walk through a wrought iron entrance and down stepping stones, huge stepping stones, and all of a sudden you're just stopped and you see a vista. Nothing like any of us have ever seen before. Our uh, Four Seasons Garden Club has had two bus trips in there. And of course, some of you have found Trudy back there signing her books. And today she's gonna to talk to us about how to create and have order in our gardens. And she'll talk to you with enthusiasm. Trudy? Thank you. Okay. 
about it over there. Thank you very much. You know, you have a wonderful city here. I was two and a half, a half hours early. I went for a two-hour walk, and I can't even tell you how many people said hello, gave me a smile. I felt so welcome. It was just terrific. Thank you very much. You're very friendly folks here. Um, let's see. Uh, when I was six years old, my mom assigned a piece of land to me. And she said to me, your garden will make this earth a more beautiful place than it is now. And any garden does that. So I started gardening when I was six years old. And she also told me, when your vegetables and your flowers and your fruit, when they're all ready, of course we can eat them, which appealed to me. And then you can sell them, which appealed to me even more. And then you can peddle with them, you can barter with them. And I thought, that must be heavenly. If I can go to the store, and it was at a time when money, the German Deutsche Mark, was worthless, I can go to the store and barter with my vegetables. So I became the most enthusiastic gardener then, and I am still an enthusiastic gardener now. Well, when, uh, I, I must tell you, I was born in 1936. So I'm 70 years old, I spare you the math. <laughs> <laughs> and um, of course it was wartime. And my little garden produced so many wonderful smiles. When the people walked by and they saw my garden, they saw me walk, walking in there, they smiled at me. And I've learned early in life that it is so much more fun to receive a smile than a frown. So, in the next five years, I was gardening and forget school. I was sitting in school thinking about gardening and all the things I would produce and peddle and sell and barter with. And then, when I was 11 years old, disaster struck. My father appeared, and I hadn't even missed him. He was gone at the Second World War for five years fighting in Russia, and then a year in imprisonment, and I knew him not at all. So here he was, and he said to me, he said, you got to learn, you got to bring your grades up. You got to do this, you got to do that, you got to go in the house and no pay. And I did not like him at all. <laughs> I just did not like him at all. It came to where I felt almost hatred for my father. Because my mom, I could handle her just fine. We got <laughs> along well. But my father was a problem. <laughs> Big time problem. And so I couldn't wait until I was 18 years old to get out from underneath his authority. And guess what I did? Can anybody guess? I got married, yes. <laughs> and then I found out that my dad was quite, quite an angel, actually. <laughs> because what I had picked up was just a miserable brood. And I stuck it out for five years. And when I was 23 years old, I mean, what, five important years I gave away. But I deserved it. You know, I fought my father, and my father probably said, good riddance. So when I was 23 years old, I was so, so, so very happy when my parents invited me back home. And the next three years were the, one, the most wonderful years I had lived, other than my childhood before my dad came home. And um, then disaster struck again because, and again, it came from my father. I was not dating. I thought I was through with men. Don't worry, I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but then one day, I was 26 years old, my father said, you got to go out and date. You got to find another man. You can't just sit here all your life. And I thought, oh no, this guy is going to marry me off to another crowd. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And I went straight to the American consulate. And a year later, I sailed to this glorious America. And I have loved it ever since, but listen to this. Three weeks later, I was married. <laughs> Three weeks it took, and I was married. You know, these were the days. We are on television, and I've got to watch this a bit here. <laughs> but these were the days when you wanted sex, you got married. <laughs> These things changed, you know, nowadays it's not so important. Anyway, I got married. <laughs> I married my, married my wonderful husband, Bill. And now we need to turn down the lights because we want to look at some slides. <laughs> Bill and I were married for 34 years, and then he had a sudden heart attack, and he left me 10 years ago. So I'm not happy about that, but well, anyway, gardening saved my soul. So, here, turn on, there it is. So this is the house that Bill bought for us. And before I even looked at furniture, I went to buy gardening tools. And um, I cut down that big old hedge with a little handsaw all by myself. Bill, my late husband's name was Bill, he said to me, Trudy, I want you to know that I am not a gardener. I'm not a farmer. I'm a great husband, and I know that, and I'm a great father, and I'm a lousy businessman. So gardening, farming, and business is all yours. <laughs> and I took him by his word. So when I started market day, I said, OK, fella, you're not going to own any of that either. No work, no own. <laughs> so, but he did not stop me from anything I wanted to do. And must say, I had so much freedom. And I, when I, Bill and I got married, I really did not know him well at all. I knew him just very, very shortly. And so, but it worked out. 34 years, we did fine. So anyway, this was my first attempt at gardening. And when my new neighbors and friends saw this, they came over and they said, well, this is so beautiful. And I thought to myself, if it's beautiful, I better make it bigger. <laughs> and I've been making it bigger for over 40 years. And I'm still making it bitter, bigger. I, I sit at home at night and think, do I need all that lawn? I don't think so. So this was my next attempt, and I continued to make this, what we call eine Rabatte, a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, until there was no lawn left in front of the house. And um, then when uh, that was all filled up all the way to the street, now this is the street side, I moved over to the other side. See, this is what it looked like, that's the other side. <coughs> And so this is what it ended up being. And um, when that was all under control, and I really believe that we must have our garden beds under control before we make them bigger. Because there's nothing worse, I think, than a weedy garden or a garden that has no order. It's like a picture out of focus. And so I just made sure I had it, I mean, you're never perfect, but close to perfection is possible, and then I would move on. And so I moved to the side of the house. Actually, this is also the front of the house yet. You see, um, we had <coughs> some problems with deer, and so um, we had this fence put in, and the garden bed was so large that I decided we divided right straight the middle so people can walk in right through the center. It's right opposite the front door. And uh, <clears throat> then I walked to the, south of the uh, to the south side of the house, I walked my way pit by pit around, but not until it was under control. Not totally. It'll never be under control totally. But good enough for me to not go out into the garden and become nervous. Because if you have a garden that's all stuffed with this and this and this, and I've done that too, and garden buckets and hose and 
hoses and <coughs> all this stuff around. It's not a place where your eyes can relax. It's got to be beautiful. I like to make things beautiful. So then I went on. This is the west side of the house. That was the backyard in 1964. That was the backyard. And the lady that sold us the house asked me if I liked, I asked her, you know, what do you have growing in this yard? It's one acre in Hinsdale. I mean, that's a lot of land. And she said to me, oh, do you like rhubarb? <laughs> I said, yes, I like rhubarb. I grew up on rhubarb. And I was so anxious to see that rhubarb coming up in the spring. And when it came up, it was all burdock. <laughs> she obviously had never, ever made a rhubarb pie. <laughs> burdock, of all things. This is what it looks like now. That's right opposite the back door. And there's some more. And then Bill did most things right, but he sure didn't like to dance. And I loved to dance, and I thought, I must teach this man how to dance, and he refused. And so one time for his birthday, I had somebody put in a dance floor. That's what this is leading up to. But it still didn't work. He did not like dancing, period. And that was the end of it. But it's not a, it, yeah, that's more in the backyard. And while we're at it here, this, I like pe peonies that have no secondary buds. When you, when you buy peonies, try to find those that have no secondary buds, because we always stand there in the spring taking those buds off. But there are now plant, uh, uh, peonies that have no secondary buds, and I'm after those, and it's, I really highly recommend them. They're wonderful. That's one of them. Now this, <coughs> this was the area where I had a big compost pile. You know, like most gardeners, we have this compost pile. And so I swear, I, I walked clear across America, taking all of my debris to the very back part of the lot, piling it higher and higher and higher, until I wanted another garden, and it's this garden, right where the compost pile was. <coughs> And so I thought I can just harvest this wonderful compost. Well, it didn't work that way. There was a little bit of compost underneath this debris. Everything else was dried up, had snakes in it and ants, and it was a royal mess. And so I decided, well, maybe I should learn about composting before I think I have this glorious compost pile. And so I started reading, and so I read what you need is your debris, you need heat, you need bacteria, and you need moisture. And I said, well, that is all in the ground. So why don't I just dig a hole, stuff everything in, cover it up, and not worry about it again? So I did get rid of that whole compost pile, just burying it. And a year later, I checked to see what was in there. That's where the compost was. And from that time on, I buried everything that I knew would decompose, including a whole split rail fence <laughs> that had fallen down. I made the pit so big, my neighbors worried about Bill. <laughs> and it's the pit. They kept checking to see where Bill was because, <laughs> because they really looked like grave sites. See, there I am digging, and before I garden, it doesn't matter where it is. I also have a farm, or if I help people out or my children, the first thing I do is dig a hole. I cannot garden with a hole nearby. There's not a leaf, not a bit of junk mail, not a cardboard box, not a branch that doesn't get buried in my yard. <laughs> because when I started this system, 30, probably 35 years ago, my soil, I had to make the first uh, pits, they call them Trudy pits, um, with a pickaxe. But I was determined to get that stuff, stuff buried. And so, you see, I bury everything. Absolutely everything. 
See, there's one of those pits. And you cannot tell me, nobody can tell me that you don't have enough room. I don't believe it. Because you don't have to make great big pits like this. Just make a small hole right between two perennials. You can take a quarter of the roots off of this perennial and a quarter of this, and you make your pit and you put the soil around and you put this stuff in and it doesn't bother that plant at all. It has three quarters of the roots left. So everything gets buried. And when I'm done, I cover it up with the next holes of soil, and this is a year later. I put some things actually right on top of the, com of, the, of the debris, like lilies. You put a little soil on it, you put your lily plants on top, more soil, and the heat from underneath that compost pile, they love it. It's wonderful, and I never on purpose dig out the compost. I plant right on top of it. And people say to me, how can you possibly grow a still bees in such bright sun? It's because of the truly pits down there. <laughs> That's why. Because people put a still bees in, um, under, in the shade, under an oak tree. Well, they're supposed to like shade and they're supposed to like, you know, this kind of... No, they don't. They like it moist, loose, and then you can grow them even in the sun. I have a still bees. Some of them grow that tall. Flocks, that tall, on top of a compost pile in the ground. And what I do, cover it up when it's full, put some soil on top of it, put a flax stone on top of it or a planter box or something. And then when that has sunk in and you can see it this much, it sinks and you know something has happened. Then you put a little more soil on top of it and you plant right on top of it. And that is why I have such success. Honest to Pete, it's not because I'm so smart. It's because these pits, the soil conditions, really. So, enough of that. So, I get to a point where I go traveling around and I, can t I take home every plant, whether it is in my zone or not. And I plant them. And sometimes it works and some, most of the times it doesn't. So, because I was stuffing everything everywhere, it became a nervous garden, so I started painting a picture with my garden. And I, what I do when you have a plant that has a large leaf, you put something next to it that has a fine leaf. You pla you, I play with texture and color. And you can have an all green garden because there's so many different greens. It doesn't have to have the flower. The first and Im most important thing is your, what you have left after the flower is gone. If you have a plant that looks awful, I'm, I'm going to put them in a pit. <laughs> they have to behave. <laughs> I'm, through with, I'm through with growing daisies. They grow in a, in a, in a, in a, in a meadow garden but not in a garden where it counts to have good texture and a good, a good looking garden. So I start painting with texture. Look at that, it's all green. It's all right. Texture, texture, texture. So this is what I've started doing after I, my garden made me nervous. And I want to go out there and be relaxed. And I like things big. I, don't, I wanted to have a, uh, a rock garden, but I don't like little bitty rocks. So I made it a boulder garden. <laughs> big boulders. Bold. We've got to be bold. And when you have, um, look at this. Clematis. Let's talk about clematis. They don't have, in fact, there's not a one that grows up on a trellis in my, actually there's one, a sweet autumn clematis. But the rest of them, I let them ramble, elevate them and let them fall down. And a wonderful way of doing this, put them behind a bench and drape them over a bench or a chair. It really is a wonderful look. 
that it is, is the Henry Eye, and it's beautiful falling over the boulders in the boulder garden. And then, when you get to a point where you don't know how to go on, because many times we have what I call a run-on garden, like a run-on sentence. Everything is even. And so that has to change. So what I do when I don't know how to go further, you see, I've never really studied agriculture other than what you learn in uh, when they, they stuff you into some kind of a class that you don't want to be in. <laughs> I, I learned it all on my own. And um, so sometimes it, I was stuck, you know, how to go on. So what I do then, I put a bench there, or a table, or a chair, or a boulder, or elevating it with, with uh, some planters. And I have 23 benches, so I got stuck several times. <laughs> <laughs> See there? Just a little seating arrangement here and there makes all the difference. I love it. I absolutely love it. There. That bench used to be at the cemetery down the street. And for some reason, somehow it ended up in my yard. <laughs> I befriended the cemetery caretaker, smoothed him, and all of a sudden it was in my yard. <laughs> it was all legitimate, though. <laughs> so here it is. And I, this is a clematis. It's um, Duchess of Albany. When that picture was taken, it was just one year old. It is now huge and beautiful. Cut it down to the ground, and each year I drape it over that bench. And there's just enough room for two people. That's all I need. And then we get to containers. I see so many times people have a container here, and then they have a container in the other corner, and then one over there. Group them all together. That's when you make an impact. So there are about 15 of them going up the steps to the dance floor. And that's when you have an impact. And I do the same thing with um, bird baths, for instance. If you have one bird bath, wonderful, but have five of them in the same place. The birds find they don't have one in that corner and another one in that corner and then one over here. Put them all together, and the birds find them. And then when you have to clean them, it's so much easier. Yeah. It really is. And the impact is so much grander, instead of having one here and one there and one everywhere. Put them all together. I don't know if I have a picture of that, but I have an area where I have uh, five of them all together. And this is that's fun. Just be flamboyant and think big. Always think big. And this is a, a wheelbarrow. I love planter boxes. That's an old wheelbarrow. One handle is missing. I'm, I'm pretty cheap when it comes to uh, buying stuff. So the handle was missing, and I got it for about a quarter of the price. Nobody noticed the handle missing. So you pack it up with plants. And another thing that I do, I don't buy these big, expensive things. You just nail together a few boards put a couple of four legs on it and set it in a, in, a, in a garden bed that's flat, elevated. And then when your plants come over it, nobody will know it. They look beautiful. This is one of these things that's an old reproduction grape card. And that garden bed was very flat. So I elevated it. And I love it, because that gives me now a reason and, and, and a focal point to go on with normal stuff. And it looks good. What do we have here? Oh, just playing with textures. I use house plants in my planter boxes, and especially that dark maroon rubber plant, you know, that um, ficus plant. That is so wonderful for texture, really beautiful. The other side of this wall was, is the white garden. And the parking lot is over here. And I'm not a car person. I didn't want to see the cars. So I had somebody build this a rock wall for me. It hides the cars. 
And then, of course, plant us on top. This is a planter box that's about 12 feet long and close to four feet deep. I had somebody build that for me. There used to be a fence, big old stockade fence. I didn't like it anymore, so I buried it. And <laughs> a friend of mine made this box for me. Much more fun. Now, this is an old lawn chair that was in my, it was, it has unusual, unusually large pillows, and I could not find any replacement pillows, and they had gone bad. So that chair was in my way forever, for years, and so finally I dragged it to the sidewalk for the garbage man to pick it up, and then I had a look at it, and I said, now wait a minute, that could make a great planter box. So I nailed together six boards, two on the bottom and one on the side, and this is now the planter box. That is the chair, the old chair. So we have to be creative. The thing that's wrong with this is no height in it. So if you have a planter, make sure you have some height in the center. And I, I do that now very often with lantanas. I love lantanas. It's my favorite summer flower. And you can buy the most spindly ones they sell and you prune off all the little side shoots and you stake it up and in one year you have a standard and they are so hardy and in the winter time you bring them in uh, cut the roots off cut the tops off to just a little knob plant them up put them in the house water them once in a while every couple of weeks and they don't they look terrible but they don't die either and in the spring, you take them out and you plant them and you water them, and they become, I have some that are about five years old. The stem is as thick as my, my, my arm. And they have a width like this. I found, I pirated that in, in a planter or at uh, Niagara Falls. They're doing it there, and I studied it carefully, and now I'm doing it myself. So that is very, that would be perfect if I had that in the center. So you have to have a little height. Well, I have to have a little water. That's uh, near the pond. When uh, <clears throat> I uh, boxed myself in totally, the backyard, no machine can get to the backyard. And Bill told me that. He said, Trudy, someday you're sorry. <laughs> because, and I said, oh, no problem, you know. And then I had this great idea of having a pond. And so three and a half fellas had to dig it out. The half, the half one stood on the shovel a lot. <laughs> and they wheelbarrowed it all out. And so, but nevertheless, I got my pawn. But so I recommend that you keep a little path so that a machine can go in there in case you have these grandiose ideas of building something in the backyard. So this is another little area in the back, in the pond, near the pond. <laughs> What else I have here? Oh, the vegetable garden. Are we not getting frustrated with vegetable gardens? Just when everything is beautifully ripe, the animals get it. So about 25, oh my goodness, maybe 30 years ago, I said to Bill, I've had enough of this. I'm going to have this all caged in. And this is what that is. And Bill said to me, now you have to live 200 years to make it worthwhile. But you know what? He wasn't too unhappy when he got to eat the raspberries <laughs> and not the birds. See here, the raspberries. And another thing I do, I um, take, now we're going to talk a little bit about a few good ideas that I think are good ideas. Come January, I run around and I pick up Christmas trees. And I prune them back to about this far away from the trunk. You know, the spokes, they stay. And the branches, they go in the hole. I always dig a bunch of holes in the fall so that in the wintertime I also have, have holes. <laughs> and so they go into the hole. <laughs> and um, then I plant that Christmas tree in the garden. And I use it as a trellis. It works 
beautifully, just beautifully. And they last about five to seven years. And so when they fall over, finally the bottom rotted out, choice to goes in a hole. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I like to do. Another thing I like to do is, you know, every one of us as a gardener, we, we have these little seedlings or these little divisions that we just can't part. And so what are we going to do? Those that are really precious, like hellebores or primroses and things like that, I line the vegetable garden beds with these one-gallon containers. And I fill, it with so fill them with soil, and they sit there. And then when I find something that I want to grow, I want to throw it in a hole, I plant them right into these one-gallon containers. And a year or two or three, depending on what it is, they are beautiful little plants, big plants, in these one-gallon containers. And you can take them up, plant them someplace, or give them away as presents. And the, the root system doesn't get disturbed. It works out really, really, really well. I have uh, poppies and, and hellebores and all kinds of things. And then also a thing I do, let's say a poppy grows real, is really beautiful in this one-gallon container. I cheat a little bit, I take it up, put it behind in my planter boxes, and everybody says, wow, huh? They don't know that this is just temporary sitting there. When it's finished flowering, take it back into the garden. Works really well, I like it a lot. So this is another thing that I saw the people doing in the Netherlands. They take these um, sticks and they stick them in the ground, so easy. And then they take a pot and put them on top to hold them together. Instant trellis. Here's one in the vegetable garden. They actually make pots that, uh, there are, that are designed for that system. And they have them. Some of them, they are 10 feet tall. And they hold them together with a pot on the top instead of tying it and all this stuff that we do. Just put them together with a pot. Works beautifully. There we are. What do we have here? Another thing, hmm, I don't think there's any gizmo that I have not bought that I thought I would make my life easier in the garden. Well, forget it. <laughs> it's the best thing is a spade, a shovel, a, a hole, the, the normal thing that I bought in 1964 is still the best stuff. All these time-saving machines, they just <laughs> drove me crazy. And so the, the things that I use, I have them right next door to, the, to my back door. So I don't have to go to the shed to get what I need. Time saver. And then at the end of the year, or even during the, during the year, every, every piece of, uh, of equipment that I use that is in the shed has its own number. There's a number on, the, on whatever, let's say it's a hole. That's number 10. And in the shed, it has a nail. And underneath it is the number 10. And whoa, anybody that puts it away, <laughs> not on number 10. <laughs> They're in deep trouble. Because I don't have the time if number 15 that belongs to the right uh, is on the left. Number 1 needs to be on the left and 15. So my eyes know instantly where to go, and my body knows instantly where to go, where the broom is, or whatever. So that's my German heritage, I think. <laughs> Order at all cost. It's very important to be orderly. It really is. It's not only important to be orderly in the garden, it's or important to be orderly in, 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 in life or in business. I could never have made it in business if I had not been orderly. I didn't have time enough. I have a friend that lives down the street. He's such an enthusiastic gardener. But what a mess he has. Uh, he must have 20 shovels because they're all over the place and, and spades and hoses and plastic bags and plastic buckets. And I harp at him all the time and he says, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I'll do it someday. But in the meantime, his garden is so beautiful, but it is out of focus. So don't we all love to go to 
the uh, flea markets. And at my age, I surely don't need anything, but I still like going to the flea markets. So I've decided I will collect bells. So when I'm planting, I, I hang them on a pergola. Since this picture has been taken there, it must be twice as many. And you know, it is a lot of fun. It looks nice. It sounds nice when there's a hurricane only, though. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have some sticks, and people bang them. You know, it's really nice. I like it a lot. I like a lot, a lot, don't I? <laughs> and inside, I like to bring the um, nature, the outside, inside. I was looking for a, uh, a side table for this couch, and everything I looked at just didn't fit into my house. So at a flea market, I found this box, it was $25. So I put a bouquet of weeds in it, wheat in it about 15 years ago, a glass top on it, and it's been there ever since. And every time I look at it, I think, yes, the price was right, and it looks wonderful. And I have another one that's actually an outdoor planter that's filled with pine cones. It's just one, it's nice, I like it. <laughs> and, huh. My friend, Vicky Nowicki, had a garage sale, and she sold this wonderful shovel. And I had one look at it, and I thought, well, that looks just like, like my cabinets in the dining room. So I bought it for $5, and then I put it on the dining room table because I liked it. And then I thought, well, maybe I should put something in it. So I put an arrangement in it, then I put lemons in it, and then Vicky, another friend of ours, was 90 years old, another gardener, and she, we had a party for her, and Vicky was invited. And I had strawberries in that shovel, and right on the dining room table. And Vicky walked in, and she stood still, and she said, is this my shovel? I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, I want it back. <laughs> I said, no way. And every time she comes, she said, I've been looking for a shovel like this ever since you took it away from me. <laughs> well, she's not getting it back. It was wonderful, and the shovel is my trademark. So it stays on the dining room table, no matter how formal a dinner we had. I don't have it anymore. That people come in and say, shovel on it. What is going on with this woman? I like it. Be different. So shovel. Now, another thing that I designed in, um, in the house, this is the dining room to the right and the living room on the other side. Most people would have a um, uh, railing there. I said, no, railings are useless. So I had somebody make these planter boxes. That's what they are. Underneath is storage, and then the top comes off. This is the summer top. It comes off and it's lined with um, just a, a plastic. In fact, there's also a drain. If I overwater it, the water goes outside. And so, in the winter time, it looks like that. Oh. And there grow lights overhead. And it's just a lot of fun to bring the, the, the tropicals inside and have them again the following spring. And it's fun. I like to garden in the winter inside. And then comes this moment. And I say, hallelujah. And um, then I just did my top, bathtub. Bathtubs are wonderful places if you have a window to have your, your tropicals around. So now, let me just please look at my notes. I usually don't speak from notes, but then many times I come home and I think, man, I didn't talk about this or that. <laughs> and so this time I made notes. So some things, of course, I have already covered, but the one, two things I want to uh, uh, discuss is the white butterflies, the cabbage butterflies. I remember the year when I had guests and I had broccoli from the garden, and I put that broccoli in hot water, and you know what happened. <laughs> the green worms. I tried to scoop them off, but unfortunately somebody saw it, and so I had to throw it out. <laughs> So ever since I have declared war, war on those butterflies. So I have three butterfly nets. You, you each know what I'm talking about, the little white butterflies. They're cute, but boy, they must, you must catch them. 
I have three butterfly nets, one in front of the house, it has number one on it. <laughs> one in the, at the back door, it has number two on it. And one near the vegetable garden has number three on it. So if I misplace them, I know where it was missing, see? And I catch them, and I have not had worms on my broccoli for years. It's fun to do that, and in, in, at, in the beginning they're tricky, but you get it. Sooner or later you find those little tricks to get them. You get them in your net and then you go, you know? <laughs> and in a hole. <laughs> it's all good stuff. Not much, but it's there. So the next thing I would like to discuss is the, the Japanese beetles. My goodness! People tell me not to put those traps up. About 10 years ago, I was so overrun with these beetles, I was just beside myself. So I bought 24 of them. And, every, and, and people would say, well, you're not supposed to hang these up because it brings the neighbor's beetles. Well, what beetle, tell me, says to its partner beetle, don't go over there, it's Trudy's garden. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. So I cleaned up the neighborhood. <laughs> it was unbelievable how many beetles I got. And it was actually a joy. I mean, these canisters, and don't buy the ones with the plastic sacks, the hard canisters. And please, hang them up. It doesn't matter. If you have flowers, your neighbors doesn't have flowers. You have vegetables, they don't have raspberries. They love raspberries. They come, they come, and so catch them. It doesn't matter if it belo he belongs to the neighbor. <laughs> They're welcome in my garden, because then I have this nice bucket of hot water with dish detergent in it. You froth it up a little bit, you know, you put your dish detergent in first, and then water, and then you get that can, and you dump it in there. I mean, you, you just immerse them. And they don't talk much longer. <laughs> and so then I open up the canister, dump them in a hole, and hang it up again. So I think the people that say don't have these canisters, don't catch them with these canisters, they're way off. Way, way off. So that's that. Let's see. I do not spray anything. Because if, if we spray, we kill all of our beneficial insects. If something gets really infested, and I haven't had that for years, I just I'd prefer to sacrifice the plant. I do not spray. Let's see. My children used to, if you have children, teach them to weed. And I used to, I found out that if you tell them, weed this garden bed, it'll never work. But you can tell them, pull a hundred weeds a day. And you wouldn't believe it, it goes very fast, five minutes. Hundred, I pull a hundred weeds in five minutes. And there is an end to the, to the chore for the children. So my children pulled a hundred weeds each day. That was their job, and to the end, my oldest is a math major, and even if at a very young age, she figured out how many weeds she pulled a year, and she tried to make deals, but no deals, <laughs> no deals. <laughs> We did the same thing, I mean, this is getting off gardening a little bit. We, I did the same thing in the house. It was such a job to tell them, clean up your room. I thought to myself, this, this is something, there has got to be a better way. So I designed this little system where each of us, that was Bill, my daughter Trudian, my daughter Margot, and I, we each picked up uh, 15 items and put them away in the kitchen after dinner. Hey, time for 15. So everybody jumped up, did their 15 so fast, not 14 and not 16. And off they went. I could say a half an hour later, hey, Margot's room is kind of messy. Let's all go and do 15 in Margot's room. Psh, everybody went up there to do 15. It took only minutes. It saved my sanity. <laughs> and to this day, even I, Sometimes I look at the kitchen, I, I don't want to do those dishes, and I thought to myself, I can do 15. So I do 15, and then by the time I do 15, the kitchen is cleaned. 
And even my children tell me that when, when they get down with, with a messy house, they think about doing 15, and that gets them started. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to share with you. You can do it or not. That's okay. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, another thing that I think is so clever, even if I say so myself. <laughs> I, I have these wire baskets, and every spring, I would have to go and buy that sheet moss. Well, I don't like, I like very much to be a frugal, I, I can afford the sheet moss. But I don't want to buy the sheet moss. I want to do something smarter than sheet moss. So I decided in the fall, when the, la the lawn folks are out there, I just talk them out of a couple of rolls of lawn and I leave them in the shed and in the spring, they're all dried up. The gra green grass is gone. It's like a brown mat. And so I cut that lawn, that sod, into pieces and put them in my wire baskets or whatever else needs sheet moss. I cut them up when I put up things. You know, we always find, uh, try to find a little piece of um, pottery or whatever we find to pluck the hole. Well, put a piece of that sod on top of that hole, it's perfect. And it's inexpensive. Let's see. You know, how are we doing on time here? Ooh, already an hour I talked? Whew. So, uh, let's see. I wrote down here at the very end, garbage attracts garbage. True. Think of it. Think of it. When we drive along and people throw out stuff, let's say on an intersection, and then somebody else comes and picks it up, for the longest time it stays clean. All of a sudden somebody throws something there, everybody else dumps it. And it's the same in the garden or in the house. That's why we need to be neat and orderly. I've noticed I have at this, for, uh, at this moment, I have a young lady living with me because I have this house and all kinds of bedrooms and by myself, so I invited this young girl that needed some help. And uh, so she's staying with me right now in our bedroom, one of the bedrooms. And um, she's very neat, very, very neat. She leaves nothing around. But boy, the other day, I left a glass in the sink. The next thing I knew, her glass was in the sink also. See, that's what I mean. So. <laughs> People dump on, 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 on top. Yeah, isn't that the truth? It really is. And I thought to myself, there is the proof. And if I'm sloppy, she can be sloppy, sloppy also. And I'm watching it now. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, and any questions? Or do you want some cookies now? Or what? <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> there is paper and pencil on each chair. Okay. So if they all write their questions on right. the paper, we'll take a break for refreshments. Okay. And then come back and you can answer their questions. Absolutely. Written. Otherwise, yeah, we can't hear them. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. Well, enjoy your cookies. <laughs> Thank you. One thing, uh, I have not talked about market day. There are more slides, but from this moment on, it would be slides about market day. I don't know how many people know market day. No, you don't? I can tell you the story about market day after lunch if you want to. Yes. Yeah? You want to hear that? Yeah. Everything I have ever done has its origin in the garden. It's really interesting really is, and so does Market Day, and I'd be very happy to share it with you. Okay, thank you. Also, if you're interested in getting the Project Green newsletter, there's a place to sign up for that out at the front desk. Now, if we can get our speaker back up here, we're going to have questions from the audience. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Do we have any more questions before? I th have I collected them all? Thank you. Thank you. I need to get you here. I need what? I said I need to get you over here by the... Oh. By the what is this thing? Oh. Well, oh, that's your own. Oh, okay. You don't need that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, question is, do you use mulch? Not really. Uh, okay. Well, yes and no. At the house, I do not use mulch. In my farm, which is 73 acres, indeed I use mulch. I get uh, leaves, the whole town, the little, little town of uh, Marengo brings the leaves and we spread those. We have an asparagus field of five acres and we spread those. And uh, then we get uh, wood chips. Now at the farm, I do a different kind of gardening. Not too many flowers, but I'm a conifer collector there. I love conifers. And I also love business. And so uh, because my market day grew so large, there are about 1,500 employees, I can't fiddle around with it too much anymore. So at the, at the farm, I grow, collect, and grow these conifers, all sizes, shapes, and colors. And the week before Thanksgiving, I prune them, and I sell the branches. <laughs> I get a dollar fifty a pound wholesale, not so shabby. And, and the real special ones, I charge $2 a pound. So last year, I made $5,000 <laughs> just doing that. I like little home industries. So, uh, What do you do about rabbits and other small animals that dig bulbs and eat young plants? All right. Hmm. Do I have to really answer that? Um, <laughs> Well, rabbits that... This is your microphone. That's oh. It's just the batteries. Oh. I'm not very uh, mechanically inclined. In fact, the, I have a little guest house, and um, the, the water pipe froze. And for two days, I heated that water pipe. And then in desperation, I called a fella in, and he informed me that I had been heating the sewer pipe. <laughs> 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 how, did I, how did I get there? <laughs> what was the question? Oh, <laughs> rabbits. Well, and small rabbits, animals. rabbits. Um, I pray that the neighbor cat gets them, <laughs> or the drive, the car driving by gets them. In all the years I've been gardening, I have these have a heart traps, and in. Forty-some years, I caught one rabbit. They just don't like the trap. So I have that problem also, but uh, it's not too bad. Not too bad. Maybe uh, your garden is so big you can't tell that they've eaten much from it. Oh, the, yeah. Well, I know it. Maybe. I know it. And I also look in the spring for nests to make sure that I get rid of those. And as far as chipmunks are concerned, I catch them truly by the hundreds. They're a real nuisance. They're a real nuisance. Luckily, if they get into the, I usually go to the farm on Thursdays, and if they go in on Wednesday, they get to go to the farm. If not, <laughs> I teach them to swim. <laughs> and they don't learn. No. What I, materials? Is this on television? What? <laughs> this is on television, right? <laughs> what materials did you use to enclose your vegetable garden? Just chain link fence fencing, mm -hmm. and then in the bottom, I had somebody bury uh, some sheets of plastic, thick, so they cannot bur burrow under it. And then, about two feet high, I put uh, chicken wire. So nothing can get in there. Any tips for the heavy work? Digging as we get older. No, just do it a lot and you get used to it. <laughs> By the way, I would like to know, many times people ask me how many gardeners I employ. At my house, I'm the only farmer there. I have no help. Le last year, my children insisted that I would get somebody to mow the lawn. And that's, that's great. I, I, I enjoyed that. But other than that, I'm the only gardener there. At the farm, I have a full-time one helper. 
he's worth 10. He's terrific. How often can you reuse the Japanese beetle canisters? Forever. All you need to do is buy new pheromone and floral lure. And it comes in a little package. You can get it at the nurseries. But the, the container itself, years and years. Unless you buy the plastic sacks, and I don't recommend that. Do you have a favorite season for visiting the Chicago Botanic Gardens? Oh, no, it's wonderful at all seasons. I was there two weeks ago, and it was fabulous, even in the winter. Great place. Explain peonies with no secondary buds. Okay, that is something some fabulous person came up breeding them with no secondary buds. Do you know what a secondary bud is? You have your main mm -hmm. bud, and then you have these side buds, and most of us think we need to pick those off to get that fabulous flower. And now there are those available that have no secondary That's buds. That's new to me, too. <laughs> well, I buy them at a lady in Hinsdale, or I don't know, she's in Downers Grove, I think. Uh, she has them, and I just can't remember. Um, you could call me, and I'll, I'll give you her name, but she's in Hins, in, near Hinsdale there. She has beautiful ones, just beautiful. So. Do you have any of the original plants that were on the property when you purchased it, trees or so forth? I have uh, very few trees and no burdock. <laughs> 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 Most of my trees I planted myself and many of them were anywhere from 25 to 75 cents, this big. As a matter of fact, at the farm, I have literally hundreds of trees that I purchased, you know, little seedlings, and now they are 25, 30 feet tall. And I still plant those little things, and people probably think, how long does she think she's living, you know? <laughs> that keeps you going. That's right. What are living walls? Living walls is anything that blocks the neighbor with anything that he can make tight. So it could be evergreens most, most of the time, evergreens. That's all the questions, and I don't know if people want to stay and hear about your, uh, you have some more slides about your. Well, it depends on. Yes, the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, the marketplace. Yeah, market day. So, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Okay, we need to turn the light off again. And I'm glad to know that this is a battery. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't be, you can't know everything, right? <laughs> I know what a burdock is. <laughs> I learned that early. So, all right. Oh, where's that thing? Oh, yeah. Wait a minute, gotta pick up this one first. And then, there we are. All right, okay, we have this picture and this picture, and this is Bill. Bill was an airline pilot, and um, <laughs> when flying around was still fun. He was a captain for United Airlines, and so I could bob around the world wherever I wanted to go, for nearly free. I mean, we paid $5 to fly to Hawaii first class. But those days are gone. It's no fun anymore. Really not at all. Last time I flew, I was wearing my underwear and a and, and long skirt and a little jacket. They made me take that jacket off. And I said, no way, I will stand here in my underwear. <laughs> and so, I mean, and so they took me into a back room and basically stripped me. And I haven't flown since. I mean, it's just no fun. So anyway, so I flew around this, the world, and because we had such a wonderful life, wonderful house, wonderful children, one year I came home from one of these trips. It was to the South China Sea, and I had met some missionaries there. And I came home from that trip looking at my garden, looking at my house, and I decided that I will become a fundraiser for mission work. So I started selling some of my plants. And I sent that money to mission work. 
but in the winter time I had nothing to pedal. So I started a little co-op out of my garage. Well, what I started to do first, I, um, I did uh, floral arrangements, wedding flowers and um, church decorations, and the money that I received for that I sent to mission work. And the flowers that I used for that project, those projects, I bought in Chicago at the wholesale market. Somebody introduced me to somebody and so I was able to buy them wholesale. And once I got used to going around Chicago, I thought to myself, I wonder what else there is that they are selling down there. And I discovered the produce market. Oops, I was in New Guinea. <laughs> I forgot that's in there. <laughs> I forgot I was in there. I wasn't so sure of myself. I didn't want to bring one of those home, I tell you that. <laughs> so here I was at the produce market. And so one day I took home, I bought 13 cases of produce. Don't ask me why. I was so proud of myself. It was fresh and inexpensive. And I took it all into the kitchen and I put it on the kitchen table. It was piled full of stuff. And then Bill came home and he said to me, what is that? And I said, it's the best and freshest and most inexpensive produce you've ever seen. And he said, yeah, that's nice and fine, but who's going to eat it all? And I said, well, we are. And he said, no, we're not. How can you eat 24 hats of lettuce and 88 oranges and 100 apples? And oh, I thought, my goodness, he is so right. <laughs> Hated to admit that, but he was right. And so he said, well, call your friends and share this. So I called five of my friends and I told them my predic predicament. And they said, sure, we'll take a share. So they, we shared it. Six of us shared this lot. And when I looked at my lot, it was still too much. So I called one more person and so did everybody else. So 12 of us shared that lot and it was absolutely perfect. Everybody got, you know, a few apples and... A, one cauliflower and so on. Well, a few, week, a few days later, these friends said, you know, this was really great. And we each had little children, you know, and anything that we could help do to help the budget was welcome. And so they talked me in to doing it again. And so I thought, well, I go to get my flowers on Fridays anyway, so why don't I just bring this home? And uh, so every Friday, we shared, the 12 of us shared a lot. And soon, there were more people saying, hey, this is really great. I hear you what you're doing, and could I be part of it? And I thought, well, if we grow in lots of 12, I could do that. And then a friend of mine who knew of my fundraising efforts for missionaries, he said to me, Trudy, you have a built-in uh, uh, fundraiser right here. You're not charging anything for your efforts to bring home these vegetables. Why don't you charge something? And I thought, why wasn't I so smart? <laughs> and so I thought, well, when we give to the church, we tithe 10%. So why don't I add 10% and give that to mission work? So I asked my customers, would you mind if, we, if I added 10% and everyone said, no, of course not. So I had my little co-op going, 24 people, 36 people, 48 people, 60 people, and all of a sudden I had to borrow trucks <laughs> because I couldn't lug it all home. And so every Thursday I looked around for somebody to give me a truck. So 84 people was my limit, and I made anywhere between a hundred and fifty and two hundred and fifty dollars, something in that. Because in the meantime, I added what I liked. I saw that they were selling meat and cheese and bread and all that stuff that we need. So I brought it home. And the next thing I knew, there was a blackboard. I want fifty pounds of potatoes, you know, Idaho's and, and all this. And I brought it home. Well, that went on from <coughs> 1972 to 1975. And in 1975, 
my daughter Trudy Ann came home from school and she said to me, Mother, would you please bake a cake? We want to raise some money for the learning center. And I said, no. And that was so foreign to everyone because Mother always did try to please. But I knew that when I bake a cake, I don't bake it out of a box. And so they sell my cake for half of what it was worth and I did not like that kind of business. So I said, I'll give you $10 instead. And well, she started crying. And she couldn't wait for her daddy to come home and tell him what a mean mother she had. <laughs> so when Bill came home from a flight, he heard the story and he agreed. He said, you cannot send her with $10. And I said, I'm not going to bake that cake. I dug myself a hole and I was in it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Bill said to me, the last thing he said at night, at night you better think of something. <laughs> and I thought, all right, yeah, I better do because I'm in trouble. And I thought, well, why don't I just take my customers from the garage, move them to the school, ask them to pick up at the school, invite everyone that goes to the school to participate, and we'll have one big co-op. So I proposed this to my family, and everybody said, hmm, how much money are we going to make? And I said, I'm sure you're going to make $250, $300. That was okay. So she called the told the principal what I would do and what I wouldn't do, and so he called me, and I, and I explained it, and he said, sure, we'll do it. So we had our first market day on, um, on, on April 20th, 1975, and we made over $300. And everybody was happy. So I thought that was the end of it. <laughs> a few weeks later, the principal called me up and he said, the customers are calling. They would like to have that again. They like the stuff that you brought, ground beef and shrimp and all these things. So Bill was president of the school board at the time. And he said, do it. I'll take care of the girls. We need the money in the district. So I said, all right, I'll do it, but they're not going to get my customers from the garage that goes to mission work. And, he's, and the principal and Bill and everybody said, fine, we'll do it by ourselves. I said, okay, I'll do it for you once a month to raise money for the school. So I typed up that next order sheet. I used to give it to the school to reproduce it. And before we had that second sale at Walker School in Clarendon Hills, Another school called me up and said, we have heard of what you're doing, can you do it for us? <laughs> that was the beginning of market day. I was a truck driver, I forgot what next here, wait. Oh yeah, there's my own conveyor system here. <laughs> hmm. Long time ago. <laughs> This is what I sold for nine dollars. Everyone had to get the same thing unless they wanted a whole case. It was a mixture of fruits and vegetables. And if they didn't like kohlrabi's tough luck, <laughs> they, I told them, sell it to the neighbor, you will make money. <laughs> so um, they took what I brought. And so this was my first office, garage. Hmm. This was my first truck that my dad bought for me. My dad was a very benevolent person. And when he saw what he was doing, he came from Germany to visit. He loved it. He said, when he saw that I was always borrowing trucks, he said, you've got to have your own. So he bought this. And in the meantime, this was too small also, but I had somebody deliver the produce. So I just picked up the meat and as you can see, it was not refrigerated. And I got caught. So the health department said, you need to have a refrigerated truck. So that was my first refrigerated <laughs> truck. <laughs> I learned to drive a truck pretty fast. I remember the first time I drove to Chicago with a big truck, I thought, I can't do this. I cannot do this. And so I'm going to bake myself a sign, please be patient with me, first time trucker. 
But I was so busy, and then when I got to the loading dock, I just asked for help, you know? And I backed in that truck, and I learned on the job. But one time, I was um, demolishing somebody's overhead door. They weren't too happy. <laughs> I was half taller than the door. So anyway, so now that was next. And now there are about 200 trucks on the road. And Market Day employs 1,500 people. And we have raised uh, close to $400 million for education, mostly education. Thank you. Thank you. It nearly killed me, I tell you, though. <laughs> it really nearly. But every, it's so interesting. When it's, when it's meant for you to do whatever it is, you find the strength and the, and the help. I remember I used to do all these calculations by longhand on paper, brown paper bags. And then I said to Bill, I need a calculator. And, and he said, well, to buy one. I said, it's $260. Do you remember that time? <laughs> and I said, I am not going to spend $260 for that calculator. And one time, he was a Rotarian, fine Rotarian. And one time he kept bobbing into the kitchen and he said, I won the door prize today. I said, oh. I thought, you know, another plaque or something like that. He said, don't you want to know what it is? And I said, yeah, what did you get? He showed me the calculator. <laughs> I still have it. There are no numbers on the buttons. <laughs> I mean, I was so thrilled. And that's how it happened again and again. When I was ready to quit it, Something happened, and I kept going on. Somebody would say, oh, this is so great, Trudy. This is the, these are the best potatoes you're bringing home, or whatever. And I said, all right, I'm going to do it another week. I'm doing it another month. And I did it another year, and, and I did it. I don't know how I did it. It was something. I remember one time, I, mean, I would get up every night, 1 o'clock, get up. I... I'm sure that I have a record of sleeping on the highway in my truck. I don't know how I got there. I got home sometimes. But I always made it. never had an accident. But one time, I was close to trouble. I was driving on West Madison Street. At that time, this was a horrible place. <coughs> and I stopped at a red light in my big truck. And all of a sudden, a bunch of... West Madison Streeters, jumped up on my truck and tried to pull me out. Luckily, I had it locked. I was smart enough to do that. And so they, you know, rattled the door and banged the windows, and I was scared. I was really scared. And so I just put my truck into gear, leaned on the horn with my elbows, and drove right through the red light and through them. And then for the next two weeks, I read the paper to see if that was hidden a killer. <laughs> and Bill kept think, saying to me, wow, I, I mean, I, I never read the paper. And all of a sudden I was reading the paper, but I never told him why. I was wondering if I had killed the fuck couple. So, well, there were a bunch of stories that um, some of them cannot even be repeated. I learned a whole new language down there. Words I'd never heard before. And I thought, how unbelievable. Why do they speak like that? And so as I got a little bit bigger, first I started out buying 10 pounds of mushrooms, and then I bought 30 pounds of mushrooms, and then all of a sudden I bought 200 pounds of mushrooms, and 500 pounds of mushrooms. And finally I said to them, when I come, I don't want to hear that language. I'm not going to buy from you anymore if you don't stop this language. And then they would say, Trudy is here. <laughs> <laughs>